was very successful in his life, number one. Number two, he had a tremendous impact on his countrymen. As long as he was alive, the people of his nation served the Lord. After his death, as long as those who were associated with him lived, the people served the Lord. So, we ask, what sort of a man has an impact like this? And we look at some of the areas of Joshua's life. We saw how Joshua was shaped in the very presence of the Lord. He spent his time in the tent of meeting and he spent his life in the tent of meeting and there in the presence of the Lord his life took shape. Then today we are going to look at the Bible's formula for success. You know, everyone wants to be successful in life. And uh, various people say various things that must be in place if you must see success in your life. Does the Bible have a formula for success? Yes, it does. And we will look at that today. So I want to turn in your Bibles to Joshua. Chapter 1, verse 6. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Okay. So what is God's formula? Be careful to do everything that is written in the book of the law that Moses gave. Okay, what is this book of the law? Okay, before the time of Moses, there was no Bible at all. Okay, God's word in written form was not available for people. Moses was the first man God picked to begin the writing of the Bible, God revealed many things to him and Moses put that down. We read about it in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and possibly also the book of Job was written by Moses. Okay, so five to six books Moses wrote and uh, God told Joshua, Hmm. This is what you have to do. Be careful to do everything that is written over here. Over time, others will add to what Moses had begun. The Spirit of God will lead Joshua, Samuel, and many others in the Old Testament. Hmm. And those who put the New Testament down, God through his spirit, directed the writing of the Bible. Today, we have the complete Bible with us. But in Joshua's time, the Bible consisted of what the spirit of God had moved Moses to write. That was the Bible. Okay, And this is what God was telling Joshua. If we were to put it in terms that you and I today will be able to understand. Be careful to do everything the Bible says. Do not depart from it either to the right or to the left. Okay. Be careful to do everything that is written in the Bible. Okay. So uh, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Okay. So 
So again, if we were to put it down in terms of how we will speak today, how does it go? Do not let the Bible depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do everything on it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Or in other words, what is the formula for success according to the Bible? I should read his word, reflect on it, and be careful to do everything that is written in it. The Bible is sufficient to instruct me in God's ways. The Bible is sufficient, as we read later on in 2 Timothy, the Bible is sufficient, it is adequate to thoroughly equip me for every good work. I need the Bible and nothing beyond the Bible. Okay, so uh, today people have the tendency to listen to modern motivational gurus, hmm? people who teach the art of living, people uh, you know uh, who teach how to live a life that is full of wellness, you know, stuff like that. They may be speaking out of their intelligence, their wisdom, and their great learning, their experience. But the Bible is different. The Bible is written by all sorts of people. Some of them were very highly educated, like Moses and Paul. But some of them were ordinary men, like Peter, who was a fisherman. Some of them were like David, kings. Others were ordinary people. Okay. What makes the Bible unique is that whether it was a learned man like Moses who wrote or it was a simple fisherman like Peter who wrote the Spirit of God moved them to write. What Moses put down was not because he was a very smart guy, very highly educated guy, but because the Spirit of God moved him to write what he wrote. Okay, so when we read the Bible, what we have access to is divine wisdom. And that is why if I read God's Word, reflect on it day and night, and live in accordance with it, then my life will be different from the lives of other people. <clears throat> I need the Bible plus nothing else. The Bible is written for me and I can understand it when I read it. Okay. Moreover, the Spirit of God, who is the real author of the Bible, he used human instruments, but he is the real author. If I'm a child of God, the same spirit lives within me. And when I read God's word, okay? Now, when I say I, I'm not talking about I, Stanley Nelson, okay? The I is generic. It is not just me, but you, any child of God. When we read God's word, his spirit illuminates the scriptures and gives us insight, gives us understanding. And as we read God's word, his word comes alive. And we are able to understand what God meant to communicate to us. Bible is not a mysterious book which only a few people who have spent years hmm, studying it can understand. Now, I do not say and that 
you should not be careful in your study of God's word. You must read it carefully. You must understand it. Keeping in mind the context in which certain words were spoken. Hmm? But the Bible is meant to be understood. It is not meant for special people. It is meant for ordinary people like you and me. We can read God's word. We can understand God's word. Okay. Then <clears throat> how important is God's word? Hmm? You know, some people came to our Lord. Hmm? He had already established a principle in his life. Hmm? The principle of walking in the light of God's word. If you remember, at the very outset of his earthly ministry, hmm, the evil one came to him. And as he was just coming out of a 40-day <coughs> period of fasting, the evil one suggested to him to take the stones that were there and change them to bread to eat. The Lord immediately responded, man does not live on bread alone. Is that what he said? He said, it is written that man does not live on bread alone. Okay. He was referring to the Bible that then was to define his conduct. He was not going to depart from it to the right or to the left. Okay. In the Bible, it was written that a man does not live on bread alone. Otherwise, if the Lord was not walking in the light of the scriptures, according to what was defined by the scriptures, then what Satan suggested may have seemed to him as a good idea. Okay, He's not eaten anything for 40 days. Hmm? Someone comes and tells you, hey, you have the ability. Why don't you change these stones into bread? Why do you have to wait till you return to civilization and find a loaf of bread? You can get it right here, right now. But the Lord immediately saw it was not about eating bread. There's nothing right, wrong in eating bread. Nor is there anything wrong in the ability to change stones into bread, nor in the use of this ability to satisfy his hunger. <coughs> but the issue was about priorities. And because he had chosen not to depart to the right or to the left from what was defined in God's word, he was able to immediately say, man does not live on bread alone. Okay. Alone is a very important word. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Okay. Priorities. Hmm? Then the evil one said, okay, after he had taken him to a high point, throw yourself down. For it is written. Okay. The Lord said it is written. The evil one also said it is written. Hmm? Throw yourself down. For it is written. That he will send his angels to. Keep you. From dashing your feet. Against the stones. Then. The Lord immediately responded. But it is also written. Okay. Not only what is written. But what is also written, being thorough with God's word, not just taking a small part of it and becoming obsessed with it and thinking that is the whole truth. No, what is written is important. What is also written is also important. Okay. Our Lord had defined this at the very outset of his ministry. This is how. He is going to live. So, so when some Pharisees came to him, uh, sorry, when some Sadducees came to him with a story, 
of a man who was married and who died without leaving any children. And then his brother married her, but he also died without children. Then his brother married, so on, till all seven brothers hmm, married her, died without children. Then the woman also died. Then they came up with a question. Hmm. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Now, there was a reason why they asked this question. Sadducees were materialists. They did not believe in life after death. They believed that this life was all there is to it. Okay. But the Pharisees taught otherwise, and most of the Jews believed in a life after. So their question was an implication. Hey, if there is a resurrection at all, then it, it could lead to chaos. Like seven men claiming this woman as their wife. So, of course, there cannot be a resurrection from the dead. The Lord then replied, and I want you to listen very carefully to his words. You err. Meaning, you are in the wrong. You err. Because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. So I want to put to you something. A man is wrong in his view, in his outlook, in his attitudes, to the extent to which these depart from God's word. You err because you do not know the scriptures. You are in the wrong because you are not familiar with the scriptures. So familiarity with the scriptures, being thorough with the word of God, helps me to be in the right. Okay? So we'll make a statement again and again. To the extent you are ignorant of God's word as revealed in the scriptures, to that extent you are wrong in your actions, in your words, in your thought processes, in your attitudes, to that extent you are in error. Okay? Be a person of God's word. Be a person of God's word. Okay, then sometime later, okay, <clears throat> uh, some people, okay, this was not really sometime later, it was sometime earlier. Some people came to the Lord and questioned him. What do you have to say about divorce? Is it okay for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Then the Lord told him, okay, what do you read in God's word? Okay, he does not say, well, let me think over this question that you have just asked. It's a good question. Let me think. Hmm? Let us see what people do about this matter. Hmm? Let us consider the different cultures. Let us consider our own culture, our own history. Okay. Let us look at the writings of the great rabbis. No, 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 no. What do you read in the scriptures? Okay. Do you not read that from the very beginning, he who created them, made them one, what God has joined together, do not let man separate, full stop. So, whether it is about what you believe, like when he was discussing with the Sadducees, or about how you live your life out, as he was discussing with those when he was questioned about divorce, one thing was very clear. A man's belief system and a man's code of conduct or his faith and his practice, his philosophy of life and his lifestyle must be entirely rooted 
in God's word. Okay, the word of God must be the basis of your thinking. The word of God must be the basis of your lifestyle. But how can the word of God be the basis of my thinking and my lifestyle if I do not spend time reading God's word? If I do not spend some spend time reflecting on it, thinking about it, being careful to understand it. Okay? So in our busy life, we do not have time. If you remember, this is how the Apostle Paul put it. Do not go beyond what is written. What is written is adequate as a guideline. Okay? I do not minimize hard work in studying God's Word. One of these days, we will take a session on how we study the Word of God to extract from it contents that we can apply in our life okay we will see how we can do it and we can illustrate it with a structured study so that we can daily apply it in our lives okay <clears throat> so let's go back to joshua God told Joshua, this is how you should live your life out. Be careful to meditate on what Moses, your predecessor, Moses, my servant, laid down in what was then the Bible. Okay, so this is how Joshua began. His life. Okay, so uh, let us illustrate it about how Joshua was careful to do everything God revealed to him, either directly or through what he had already spoken to Moses, and Moses had put down faithfully in what was, as we said, the Bible at that time. Okay. <clears throat> Then uh, we will turn to uh, chapter 3, Joshua, chapter 3, verse 5. Are you ready? Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Okay. The last time we were <clears throat> talking about Joshua, that was on Saturday. We, we, Saturday we were talking about the makings of a leader. And we said how the men were chosen to spy out the land so that they will be exposed to what the rest of the population will be exposed to ahead of them. And this exposure would also be a time of testing. God will observe how they respond to those situations. Are they responding in faith and obedience? Or are the circumstances that they observe with their eyes hmm, cause them to stop trusting in God and start using their own head? Okay? So, so, Joshua had proved himself. He responded correctly. So while he and the other one who responded correctly, Caleb, were retained as leaders, the other them not only lost their leadership, they actually lost their lives. 
so that the people will know, the people will know how God deals with those who do not have faith. Okay? Now, for those of us here who are leaders, I'm going to read something extremely disturbing from God's word. Keep your hand here on Joshua chapter 3 and turn for a moment to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews chapter 13. And verse 7. <clears throat> Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Okay. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Okay, so let's look at the verse in reverse. We begin with the word faith. Faith is internal, it is invisible, but it makes itself known in a certain lifestyle. My faith shapes my lifestyle. Okay. My lifestyle is visible. You understand? Faith is invisible, but it evidences itself by the way I live out my life. Okay? I do what I do because of what I believe. People may not know what I believe, but they sure can see the actions that my faith produces. Okay? All right. Then, Consider the outcome of their way of life. Oh, the way of life has an outcome. Hmm? God wants the people of God to consider the outcome of the lifestyle of leaders and imitate their faith. Okay, so let's go in reverse. In my heart, there is faith and no one else can see it except God. But this faith manifests itself in a certain lifestyle which others can see. Not only can they see my lifestyle, they also can see the outcome of my lifestyle. Okay, like for example, since we were talking about Joshua, we know about the outcome of Joshua's life. What was the outcome of Joshua's life? He served God all his life. His family served God. His household served God all their lives. Okay. People who knew Joshua served God all their lives and people whom they led served God all their lives. Okay, so this was the outcome of Joshua's life. This outcome was the result of Joshua's lifestyle. And Joshua's lifestyle was the outward manifestation of his inward visible, invisible faith. <coughs> okay. Faith results in a lifestyle. A lifestyle has an outcome. An outcome is there for all the people to see. <coughs> so God says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider God is inviting his people to consider, to weigh the outcome of the lives of certain individuals. And he says, this outcome flows from their way of life and this way of life demonstrates their faith. God wants us to consider the outcome of people's lives and imitate the faith of those people. Okay? Are you with me? Huh? So, so, here we go. Hmm? Back to Joshua, chapter 3. Hmm? He is instructing the priest. What is he instructing the priest? Hmm? God is telling him to instruct the priest to walk ahead. Right? Verse 6. 
Joshua told the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass on ahead of the people. Okay, the people are watching. Here are the priests. They are walking towards the water and the people are watching. Okay, then Joshua is instructing them. God is telling him to instruct them. Verse 8, tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. What was going to happen? The river Jordan was going to stop flowing. Okay. And the people will cross the river Jordan on dry land. Hmm? Just as God had parted the Red Sea and allowed the people to walk on foot. But this is not the generation that had experienced the parting of the Red Sea. They had only heard about it. Remember, those who were more than 20 years old and who had witnessed the parting of the Red Sea died in the desert. This is the next generation. Okay? This is the next generation. And they have only heard about these things. They have not seen it. Now, they want faith in the word of God to be demonstrated in the lives of the priests. So God is telling the priests to go ahead. When they go ahead, the river is not going to stop flowing. They are not going to step into a dry river bed. They were going to step into water. When they obey God in faith, then the river will stop flowing. Okay. The people will see the outcome of the obedience of these priests. The priests will obey because they have faith. Okay. Faith results in a lifestyle and the lifestyle will have an outcome. The river Jordan will stop flowing. Then the people, their hearts will become strong. And as the priests go ahead of them, they will follow behind. Okay. So, Christian leadership has a tremendous responsibility. Okay. There is a responsibility to live an exemplary lifestyle. Lifestyle, the outcome of which is all too visible to the eyes of the people. They will see that outcome and they will imitate the faith of the leader. Okay. Demonstrated in Joshua's life. Now, those who are going to be co-leaders with him, he is encouraging them to allow the faith in their hearts to be demonstrated externally. Okay. So let's let's read on. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> verse 9. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, etc. Verse 11. See the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Okay. Now then, choose from each tribe. Choose one man from each tribe. And as soon as the priest who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan its waters flowing downstream will be cut off <coughs> and stand up in a heap. <coughs> so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest standing, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. <coughs> God chose the time of the year when the river Jordan was in flood. So the priests were not to step into shallow water. The river Jordan was in spate. And 
they will step into a raging river. And as they step into it, the water will stop. Faith being demonstrated not when conditions are favorable, not when conditions are favorable, but when conditions are least favorable. Okay, if you were to read commentaries about on the book of Exodus, you know, they will talk about how, uh, how the river turned red because uh, that was when you know. The, uh, the water from the mountains came and that is when certain algae will um, uh, which uh, caused the water to be seen red uh, will cover the place and you would think that it is blood flowing then it's not a miracle okay the plagues were miraculous hmm? a miracle is when conditions are unfavorable not when conditions are favorable okay then all right Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the waters from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. Okay. At a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zaritha, where the, while the waters flowing down to the Sea of the Araba, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Okay, so this is how it goes. A man is familiar with what God has spoken. And he obeys God's word, carrying out its instructions. He does it when circumstances are saying everything they can against carrying out what God wants you to do. Okay? The man does it because he has faith. Then, because he obeys God, faith is not just what you agree with in your mind. Okay. Faith is always seen in obedience. Okay. When obedience happens, the water stopped flowing. Obedience produced a visible action. Okay. Suppose those priests had been swept away by the river Jordan. Then the people would have good reason for not venturing into the water. But they saw God's hand demonstrated when they saw the obedience of the priests to Joshua who obeyed the Lord because he trusted in God and sent the priests on ahead to do what God had told them to do. Okay. So remember what we read in Hebrews chapter 13. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So the people could consider the outcome of what the priest did and imitate the faith of the priest. Okay. <clears throat> now Against knowing God's word and living by his word are other alternatives. One could go by what people do under the circumstances. So this is what Abraham did. Abraham, the Bible refers to as the father of faith. Abraham is also referred to as the friend of God. Even a friend of God who is so well known for faith can in his life have lapses. So we should be very careful about looking at people and imitating them. 
I'm saying this because we're talking about imitating leaders. Okay, so we should be careful about leaders. Even good people have lapses. Even the man after God's own heart can lust after his neighbor's wife. Okay, but consider the outcome of what he did. Okay, so back to Abraham. Abraham did not have children. What were people accustomed to doing under the circumstances? Take an additional wife. Sadly, in our own land, very often people still do it. Okay, so at Sarah's suggestion, her servant, Hagar, was taken as a second wife. Okay. She became pregnant. Then what happened? Was the problem solved? Sarah still remained barren. Her problem was not solved. Instead, her problem got compounded. Hagar, who was now pregnant, despised her mistress, Sarah, who was not able to conceive. Sarah's problem became worse. Then she takes this up with Abraham. What does Abraham do? Abraham tells her, she's in your hands. Your servant, do what you want to do. Okay. Neither before he took Hagar, nor now when there is a problem in the family, does Abraham think of seeking God in this? Nor for that matter is Sarah seeking God. Instead, she does what she thinks is the right thing to do under the circumstances. So she starts ill-treating Hagar. And Hagar does what she thinks is the best under the circumstances. She ran away. Okay? Nobody is asking God. Then God sends an angel to stop Hagar in her tracks and send her back. Go back to your mistress, says God through his angel, submit to her. Oh, not always a pleasant thing to do what God wants us to do under the circumstances. But Hagar obeyed God. She returned to her mistress. Must have been so difficult after you walked out on her. Hmm? You think conditions became better just because she obeyed God. But she was able to have a safe confinement and delivery. Her son Ishmael was born. And Abraham loved Ishmael. Okay. Of course, later on, God asked Abraham to do what was very painful to him. Send Hagar and Ishmael away. He obeyed God. But I want you to think about this. And Abraham and Sarah, instead of trusting in God and waiting for him, took the matter into their own hands and tried to find a solution their problem actually multiplied. And how many years back was that? Would you know? Abraham was approximately 2000 BC. We are a little more than 2000 AD. This was 4000 years back. And the descendants of Ishmael Hagar's son, 
they are a constant source of problem for the people of Israel. An act of indiscretion, which will have an outcome, not only in one's life, but in the lives of one's children, children's children, their children, their children, their children, even 4,000 years down, okay, as parents, we are leaders in our home, right? Our children look at the outcome of our way of life and will imitate our faith. Our children will live with the outcome of our way of life. Okay, so let us be careful that we order our lives in the light of God's word. Okay, chapter 5. A very difficult moment in a leader's life. Let's look. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Araloth. Okay, so let's look. Earlier, the Jordan stood between the Israelites and the Canaanites. Now the Israelites had crossed the Jordan and they had come into enemy territory. They are camped in enemy territory. Okay. And God is asking Joshua to do something. You know what? He is asking Joshua to circumcise his army. Okay. Now how important was circumcision to an Israeli? If you read Genesis chapter 17, God institutes circumcision as a sign of the covenant between him on one hand and Abraham and his descendants on the other. Okay? So, a covenant is an agreement. And in this covenant, in this agreement or contract, God is one party. And the other party are Abraham and his descendants. Okay? So, God binds himself to do certain things for Abraham and his descendants. Okay? And Abraham and his descendants bind themselves to do certain things toward God. This is what the contract was all about. So, from God's side, he says, I will be your God. Okay? I'll provide you with the land. Hmm? I will richly bless you, etc., etc. Okay. For Abraham and his descendants, their part was to trust this God, to love him, and to walk in his ways. That was their part. Okay. I'm giving a brief summary. Hmm? Now, <clears throat> as a sign of this covenant was circumcision. Every male child, eight days old, should be circumcised. Okay. Abraham, of course, was an old man. He got circumcised when he became a member of the covenant. Okay. His son, Ishmael, was well more than eight days of age when he became a party to the covenant and Abraham circumcised him. Then, when Isaac was born, 
he was by virtue of his birth already a member of the covenant. So he had to bear in his flesh the sign of the covenant, circumcision. So Abraham circumcised him. Subsequently, every Israeli male was circumcised on the eighth day of his life. Okay? This is how God ordered and this is how they lived it. Occasionally, people had a lapse. Hmm? And oh, there was one very famous lapse. That was Moses. Hmm? God called Moses at Mount Sinai. God sent him back to the land of Egypt from where he had run away. God sent him back to Egypt so that he will become the leader of God's people and lead them out of slavery in Egypt. So a reluctant Moses finally agrees. Okay? You read that in chapters 3 and 4 of Exodus. Then Moses takes his wife and the two sons that had been born to him when he was away from Egypt and they set out towards Egypt. Along the way, we read of a very strange incident. Okay? God met them and tried to kill Moses. So immediately, we are alarmed. Hey, why is God wanting to do that? Moses is listening to him, leaving the only people he has in the world today his wife's people, taking his wife and sons to a land where he was perhaps at the head of the list of wanted people. Okay? He was wanted by the Pharaoh for a murder he had committed. God is asking him to go back. And Moses agreed with God and is on the way back. Shouldn't God be happy? Why is God trying to kill him? What happens immediately after tells us why. Moses' wife Zephyr immediately took a knife and circumcised her sons. All Moses' sons were not circumcised. You remember? You'll read that in Genesis chapter 17. God said, any male that is not circumcised will be cut off from his people. Okay? They are no longer a part of the covenant. <coughs> cut off from his people. It had two senses. One was cut off by being killed. The other was cut off by being banished excommunicated. Okay? Anyone who is not circumcised will be cut off from his people. And here were Moses' sons, not circumcised. Moses was going to be the leader of God's people. But he had not circumcised his own sons. So God was about to kill Moses. Zephora intervened. She was obviously not very happy with the whole thing. Because she touches her husband's feet with the foreskins and tells him, you have become a husband of blood to me. Okay? All right. We go now. In the land of, in, 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 in the desert, the Israelis, as they wandered, how long were they there in the desert? 40 years. Till all those who had left Egypt as adults died. So this was the next generation that grew up over there. Apparently, these were not circumcised. So now, God is asking Joshua to set right this wrong. Okay? For Joshua, as commander of the Lord's army, this must have been extremely scary to say the least. You know why? 
circumcision leaves a man in great pain and immobilized till he heals. If you remember, Jacob's sons had told the Shechemites that Jacob and his family will live among them, intermarry with them, trade with them, provided they become one of them by being circumcised. Okay? This thought appealed to the people of Shechem, especially to their crown prince who was in love with Jacob's daughter <coughs> and very much wanted her to be his wife. Okay, so the people of Shechem agree and they undergo circumcision. While they were in pain, two men, just two men, okay, Simeon and Levi, took their swords, walked in, killed everyone. Just two men could do it because all the men, the entire fighting force was immobilized because of the great pain they were in. Now God is asking Joshua to do this in enemy territory. Perhaps as a leader, he could think, hey, if I do this to my people, others will come to know and knowing that my army is not able to move. They will move in on us. Okay. But Joshua need not have had that fear because God had already taken care of that. The Jordan had stopped flowing and all the surrounding people had seen it. And they had seen what God had done and they were actually scared of the Israelis because of this incident. That's what we read earlier in this chapter. But whether Joshua knew about this or not, we are not told. He probably did not know. How could you know the thoughts in someone else's heart? But they do come to know later. Okay. When Rahab tells the spies how everyone is scared. Okay. But for now, he probably did not know. He obeys God and gets all the males who are not circumcised to be circumcised. Okay? Verse 7. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, My dear brothers and sisters, listen very carefully to this. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Gilgal means rolled away. Every time anyone went to Gilgal and wondered, hey, why does this place have such a strange name, rolled away? the people would have said, because at this place, on that day, God rolled away the reproach of Egypt. How was the reproach of Egypt rolled away? When Joshua circumcised the people, in faith he obeyed, and the reproach was rolled away. What was this reproach? The circumcision was a sign of the covenant in the flesh. When they subjected themselves to that circumcision, when they subjected themselves to that circumcision, what happened? 
the reproach of Egypt was rolled away. <clears throat> now, the sign of the covenant was on them. They were visibly the people of God, the people of the covenant. Okay. Now, what God had told Joshua through Moses, Joshua faithfully obeyed. Okay. Demonstrated in the crossing of the river Jordan, demonstrated at Gilgal. You can consider the outcome of this man's life and imitate his faith. Those of us who are leaders of our churches need to remember this. People will consider the outcome of our way of life and they will be moved to imitate our faith. Okay. As parents, we need to remember our children will consider the outcome of our way of life and they will be moved to imitate us. A very important fact we learned that we must be a people of God's word. Reading it, reflecting on it, and above all, obeying it and living it out. Okay? Our Lord demonstrated in his personal life what is written and what is also written is very important. When he spoke with the Sadducees, what did he demonstrate? A man is wrong in his life, in his outlook, in his actions, to the extent these depart from God's word. The Apostle Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, do not go beyond what is written. Then, when people came to question the Lord about divorce, he said, what is written? What do you read? And then our Lord did not opinionate. He simply stated what was written. And that was enough to provide light on the problem. Okay. Now, then uh, this part, uh, I just saw a question flash by. Didn't understand the reproach reproach of Egypt. The fact that the people of God were not bearing the mark of the covenant of God were not publicly wearing their colors. Okay, let me explain what this means. You know, in a football match, a team a team will be dressed in a uniform. Okay. This uniform shows which team you are playing for. Hmm? A soldier on the battlefield will have the country's flag sealed to his uniform. He is wearing his colors. Okay. The covenant was a matter of a heart relationship with God, but it was shown visibly Okay, with the act of circumcision in the flesh. Okay, so a Jew who was not circumcised was no Jew at all. All right, he was not having the mark of the covenant. That is a matter of reproach. This reproach was rolled away at Gilgal when the people submitted themselves to circumcision. This has a small implication for us. Maybe not so small. There is an equivalent of circumcision today. 
and that is baptism. Okay. When we are baptized, we are externally declaring something that has happened to us internally. We repented of our sin, we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we were forgiven, we became children of God, we became people of this new covenant which the Lord established. Okay, this is demonstrated externally by baptism. If you have not been baptized, then the sign of the New Testament covenant, okay, remedy this at the earliest, let this reproach be rolled away, let this reproach be rolled away, okay? We will stop here, continue, God willing, tomorrow morning, right through this week, every morning, we will meet. One small clarification. 7.30, the channel will be live. This is to facilitate, set, you know, the arrangements, setting up of this. You can start logging in 10 to 15 minutes before a Bible study will start at Okay, the channel will open before to facilitate those who are working behind the scenes making the arrangements. Hmm? So, in the message that I sent, the time mentioned was 7 30, but the Bible study time in the morning will remain 8 o'clock. Okay, uh, today evening we will have our Bible study at 7 30. Bible study will start at 7 30. Channel will open about 15 minutes before that. Okay, you can start logging in by 7:20, letting people make the necessary arrangements. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for what we could learn from the life of Joshua. We pray that we too will also be a people of the word, reading your word, studying it, reflecting on it, and living it out, Father. We pray that. Our faith, which results in our lifestyle, will be sound. Always remind us that our lifestyle has an outcome which other people can see. And we pray that our faith will be sound so that our lifestyle based on our faith will also be sound. And the outcome that is visible to all will move their hearts to imitating our faith. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. In the precious and worthy name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. God bless you. It is 10 minutes past the time that we intended to stop. So, we sign.